Welcome to the second day of Brussels Forum from beautiful, sunny Washington, D.C. Yesterday, the forum began with the NATO, NATO Leaders Summit and NATO 2030 at Brussels Forum. The day centered around how NATO must adapt to prepare for the world in 2030. Today, and for the rest of Brussels Forum, we will imagine how we can adapt democracy to thrive in the decades to come. How can we best defend our democracies against autocratic advances? What is the future of multilateralism? How can we foster resilient societies in the digital age? And how should we prepare for the next global pandemic? Brussels Forum will also focus on how the transatlantic allies can deal with a resurgent Russia and a rising China. Transatlantic Trends, a project of GMF and the Bertelsmann Foundation, polls public opinion on both sides of the Atlantic. The most recent results, released just last week, are fascinating and I encourage you to read the full report. I would like to highlight just one finding here. There is a clear transatlantic consensus for a tougher approach toward China, especially on human rights, cybersecurity, and climate change. At this past weekend's G7 summit, we saw leaders agree on initiatives to counter Chinese influence. President Biden said that those initiatives would promote democratic values and not, quote, an autocratic lack of values. Are we seeing evidence of the ability of our transatlantic democracies to deliver on key global challenges? The Brussels Forum agenda will provoke thought and spark our imagination to find solutions to the tough challenges of our time. And the Brussels Forum stage will feature an abundance of impressive speakers. We began yesterday with NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg. Today, we will begin with US Vice President Harris. On Friday, we will conclude Brussels Forum with USAID Administrator Power and Belgian Deputy Prime Minister Vilnes. Brussels Forum actually began last week with the 11th edition of the Young Professionals Summit and our Transatlantic Inclusive Leadership Network. These leaders met throughout last week and now will bring their vital perspectives as leaders of the next generation to the Brussels Forum conversation. I encourage you all to join the conversation online using hashtag Brussels Forum on social media. Before we begin today's program, I want to give an enthusiastic shout out to the dynamic duo of Nicola Leitner and Louise Langaby, the talented leaders of GMF's Brussels Forum team, and all of my GMF colleagues whose work informs Brussels Forum and who help Nicola and Louise make the magic happen. Just as nations need allies, we at GMF need partners to make that magic happen and to bring Brussels Forum to you every year. It is my pleasure to thank our founding partners, Daimler and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Belgium, our strategic partner, NATO, our forum partners, Amazon, Deloitte, and Google, our university partners who enable us to include Generation Z in this transatlantic forum, the University of Nevada at Reno, Prairie View A&M University, Tuskegee University, and the University of Leuven. A final thank you to all of our associate supporting knowledge and media partners. 
I am delighted that all of you have joined us for this exciting edition of Brussels Forum, and I am delighted to pass the baton to my wonderful colleague in Brussels, Ian Lesser. Ian, over to you. Thank you, Karen. Good afternoon from Brussels and our continuing conversation around the theme of reimagining democracy at Brussels Forum. We had a great start yesterday, as Karen said, out at NATO, uh, and we're gonna get to continue that conversation today with leaders from government, from business, from civil society, from both sides of the Atlantic and from around the world. And to open today's conversation, we are especially honored and delighted to have with us uh, Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, who's gonna join us from Washington. Madam Vice President, thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to your thoughts. Thank you, Ian Lesser, for your kind introduction. And thank you to Dr. Karen Don Fried for your leadership. President Joe Biden and I look forward to having you join our administration very soon. The German Marshall Fund of the United States was founded on one simple idea, that the United States and Europe are stronger together. And for the last 16 years, the Brussels Forum has provided the opportunity for citizens of nations around the world to exchange ideas, align our priorities, and strengthen our partnerships. So thank you all for your work. As you know, the President and members of our cabinet are currently there in Brussels consulting with our closest allies and partners. And it is my honor to join the US delegation to Brussels from the White House to address this forum. Let me restate what the President has said. America is back, and we are committed to re-engaging with Europe, to earning back our position of trusted leadership, to making our transatlantic relationship stronger than ever before. Yesterday, the President joined with allied leaders at the NATO summit to reaffirm our solemn commitment to our collective defense. Today, the United States and the European Union are committing to work together to write the rules for the future of our global economy, rules grounded in our democratic values. And the truth is we face many shared challenges, the pandemic and the resulting economic uncertainty, climate change, cyber threats, and the resulting security concerns, and of course, the outright assault on democracy that is occurring around the globe. Today, our world is entering a new era, an era that is defined by our interconnectedness, our interdependence, by our collective fragility. And because that is true, the strength of one democracy depends on the strength of all democracies. The United States was founded with the intention of perfecting democracy. Our constitutional charge is to form, I quote, a more perfect union. Our democracy, all democracies, are works in progress. Democracies require constant intentionality, constant vigilance, constant effort. It is when we stop doing that work, when we neglect democracy, it is when we take democracy for granted that the attacks are able to grow. For 15 consecutive years, the strength of democracies around the world has been in decline. Over the past year, the pandemic has revealed the flaws and fissures in our institutions. It has also revealed the fragility of our democracies. In fact, 2020 is regarded as one of the worst on record for the global deterioration of democracy and freedom. In the chaos of the crisis, autocrats have become more destructive. Human rights abuses have multiplied. The rule of law that underpins our international order is under assault. Even basic truth, even basic facts are being undermined by disinformation, chipping away at public confidence in our press, our scientists, our courts, and our elections. No region is immune from these trends. In recent years, anti-democratic factions have gained footholds in countries across Europe and in the United States. And I will never forget the horror 
and the heartbreak of January 6, 2021, when our United States Capitol, a beacon of democracy for so many, came under siege by a violent mob who refused to accept the results of a free and fair election. It is not enough to say we cannot let something like that ever happen again. We must commit and recommit our democratic principles and lead by example. We must reinforce our democratic institutions to deliver real results and instill trust. There are barriers that stand in the way of doing that. Corruption is one such barrier. Corruption causes the people to suffer. It stands in the way of progress. It stands in the way of hope. Corruption can keep people from going to the doctor, sending their children to school, opening a small business, getting a fair trial. Corruption corrodes public trust and drives away investment. It compels migration. It causes violence. And it cannot stand. This month, we announced that for the first time ever, our administration is designating the fight against corruption as a core U.S. national security interest. Together with our allies, civil society, and the private sector, the United States will prioritize the fight against corruption to preserve democracy. The fight against corruption is a fight won through accountability, through transparency. It is a fight won through strengthening the rule of law and also through the promotion of human rights. Our democracies cannot be sustained when people are denied their rights, their freedom, their dignity. We must reckon with the injustices of the past and confront those that still persist. And I'm talking about injustices that are experienced by women, by people of color, by people with disabilities, by LGBTQ people, by indigenous people. The injustices that are racism and bigotry, the injustices that are hatred and violence, the injustice that is an attack on people's basic right to vote. A democracy's strength depends on its ability to protect against injustice. When we make it possible for more people to fully participate, we improve communities, we improve countries, we improve our world. And that is why, wherever, whenever human rights are violated, we must stand together, just as we did when the United States and the EU issued joint sanctions against China for abuses in Xinjiang, just as we did when we stood up to Russia for its attack on Alexei Navalny, and just as we did when we stood up to the President of Belarus for his repression of those demanding democracy and human rights. We must stand together for democratic principles. We must stand together for democracy. Friends, that is our charge today. As our world emerges from this pandemic, as our world enters this new era, let us rise to our ambition to protect and promote democracy. The strength of one democracy depends on the strength of all democracies. I look forward to our work together. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I can't imagine a better way to start our conversation uh, today on the future of democracy. And we get to continue on this theme now uh, with a great friend of GMF and a great friend of Brussels Forum, uh, Ivan Krastev, who's the chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia, a great thought leader on these issues. Ivan, thanks so much for being with us. We really look forward to your thoughts. <laughs> 